right, guys. Um, so we are picking back up where we left off with Nietzsche's uh, Gay Science. Uh, and we are looking at aphorism 125 in the um, uh, link, the online version of the Gay Science that I sent out, uh, aphorism 125 on page 181. Um, so as we recall, uh, Nietzsche is the philosopher who declares the death of God, uh, and in this aphorism, The Madman, um, he gives us the first uh, articulation of that, the death of God. Um, so let me say a little bit about what the death of God uh, means in general before we walk through this aphorism. Um, Nietzsche is thinking about um, Christianity, certainly. Uh, he was raised by a uh, minister, he was a uh, minister's son, um, and he thought very intensely about Christianity his whole life. So when he's talking about the death of God, he is uh, certainly talking about the end of um, the Christian God, and it's a challenge to uh, Christian theology, Christian religion, but um, he has something bigger in mind also. I mean, uh, you know, um, insofar as you can get bigger than Christianity. What he has in mind with the death of God is uh, not just the end of a uh, certain theology, but also the end of, uh, of metaphysics again. Uh, God, for Nietzsche, is um, the idea of an infallible, uh, universal, and absolute truth. Uh, it goes hand in hand with his moral relativism, with his uh, relativism in general, that you would have to uh, get rid of the author of uh, an absolute truth. An absolute truth uh, has always, in one way or another, uh, relied on the idea of uh, an ineffable author of that truth, a perfect and absolute power that would guarantee uh, an absolute truth. Uh, so when he's talking about the death of God, um, he's also talking about the end of truth uh, and the end of absolutes. Uh, Nietzsche thinks that uh, the Christian idea of God derives primarily from uh, the Platonic realm of forms. Um, and there's uh, a lot to say about the way that Christian theology is based on, um, uh, on Platonic philosophy. Uh, but in general, uh, the connection that Nietzsche sees as being essential is that uh, the idea of God in Christianity is like the idea of forms in Plato, in that both of them locate truth uh, and therefore uh, the good in an otherworldly realm in a realm outside of this physical world, uh, right? It is only by placing truth and the good uh, and their origin outside of this physical world that either thing can be called absolute, uh, right? In this physical world of constant change, there are no absolutes. And so in order to... Uh, achieve something like absolute truth, you would have to uh, find it outside of this world of constant change. Um, now, for Nietzsche, there is no otherworldly realm. There is only this realm. There's only this world. Uh, so Nietzsche is a philosopher of uh, imminence, you could say along the same lines as Aristotle, but uh, that's that's a sort of schematic, um, vague way to understand it. Uh, 
he's even more of a materialist, more of a philosopher of imminence than, than Aristotle. Uh, so for Nietzsche, any appeal to another world, an otherworldly realm, uh, is going to be false. And I'll say uh, that this is connected to Nietzsche to the idea of nihilism. Um, and nihilism is often um, a charge made against Nietzsche and moral relativism uh, and many of the philosophers that follow Nietzsche and the charge is essentially uh, that these people believe in nothing. Right? Nihilism is the belief in nothing. Uh, and it's certainly true that uh, Nietzsche doesn't believe in an absolute truth or an absolute good uh, or any unchanging realm um, that will be unaffected by the events of uh, the physical world. Uh, but that's maybe not the same thing as not believing in anything, right? Uh, it's possible, certainly, uh, we would say, to believe in things uh, in this world without positing some otherworldly figure that would be the author of absolute truth like God or the uh, forms. Uh, so sometimes the charge of nihilism is simply uh, the charge of not believing in uh, an absolute truth or an unchanging value or idea of the good. Um, but Right, we can certainly say, we can reimagine what belief is uh, and say that you aren't a nihilist because you locate the origin of the good uh, and of truth in this realm, in this world. Uh, but what belief might look like will, will change. Um, now, for Nietzsche, nihilism, in fact, uh, is caused not by moral relativism, not by uh, those who challenge Christian theology or Platonic metaphysics, uh, but in fact for Nietzsche, uh, Christian theology and Platonic metaphysics are themselves nihilistic. Uh, Nietzsche writes a lot about nihilism, He's the first philosopher to uh, really delve into the problem of nihilism and to analyze uh, the causes of nihilism. Uh, and for Nietzsche, um, counterintuitively, um, in you know counterintuitively to uh, the mainstream view, the true nihilists are uh, the Christian theologians and the Platonic metaphysics uh, metaphysicians. This is because, uh, for Nietzsche, any system of belief that is based on an otherworldly realm is based on nothing. Uh, that there is no otherworldly realm. We have no evidence of its existence. Uh, we have no evidence of uh, God's existence. Um, and the belief in God is a belief in, uh, in something that has never presented itself uh, and which cannot be known or experienced. And the same is true for Platonic forms. Uh, you never have an experience of a form and you can't know a form uh, in the way that you can know a physical object. So for Nietzsche, uh, any metaphysics, including the metaphysics of Christian theology, that's based on uh, this otherworldly realm is, in fact, based on, uh, on a nothingness, uh, a, a, an absence, something that does not exist. So Nietzsche thinks that the, um, the collapse of Western metaphysics and uh, doubt about Christianity um, are not things that uh, come from outside of Christian metaphy uh, of metaphysics and, and Christianity, but are instead uh, structurally built into Christian metaphysics and uh, and, and Platonism. Um, 
right? So that uh, losing faith or having doubt about the forms is something that is provoked by those metaphysical systems themselves. Um, so nihilism then is uh, a sort of inevitable consequence of any system of belief that uh, insists that the good and truth lies in this otherworldly realm, which Nietzsche thinks is inherently a kind of nihilistic belief. So let's, uh, let's look at what he says in Aphorism 125. Uh, he says, it's a story about uh, a, a madman, a madman who declares the death of God. It's a very complicated story, actually. So he says, the madman. Have you not heard of that madman who lit a lantern in the bright morning hours, ran to the marketplace and cried incessantly, I seek God, I seek God. Because of this madman, to begin with, is seeking God. Uh, this is important, right? Um, the madman does not begin by declaring uh, that there is no God, but is seeking God. This is fitting for someone who believes that uh, if you locate God and truth outside of this world, uh, then uh, you're going to be constantly seeking God. It will be impossible to find God. So perhaps we understand this as uh, the impossible task of seeking God when God lies outside of this realm, uh, as do, like platonic forms. Um, or we can see this as uh, the madman seeking uh, a new kind of God, a God that would be found in this realm itself. As many of those who did not believe in God were standing around just then, he provoked much laughter. So, who is this madman talking to? He's talking to people who don't believe in God already, who've lost their faith. And so this search for God provokes laughter. Now again, we should always be reading uh, as much into these metaphors as we can. Uh, it's important that this takes place in the marketplace, uh, right? And there's certainly a callback to uh, the Bible story in which uh, Jesus ransacks the, uh, the marketplace set up in the temple. Um, what do these people believe in? They believe in the market. Uh, and what has the, the cause of unbelief been? Uh, the market. Where is unbelief most prevalent? in the market. Uh, this is important, so he says. And what do these market goers say about the madman? They ask, has he got lost? Did he lose his way like a child? Or is he hiding? Is he afraid of us? Has he gone on a voyage, immigrated? They thus yelled and laughed. So the search for God for those uh, in the market appears to be the task of a child, the desire of a child, right? God has become something uh, that is uh, unimportant and a kind of plaything um, for those in the market. So uh, Nietzsche is here pointing out um, that God, even for those operating in a uh, Christian world, um, has become unimportant. It's not a question that is pressing in most people's lives. The madman jumped into their midst. I'm sorry, um, let me go back and point out one more image in this opening paragraph that I meant to mention. And this is this important image of the madman carrying a lantern in the bright morning hours. Uh, why do you light a lantern in the morning? It shows that this madman is out of sync with uh, the natural order in some sense. Um, and, right, obviously this is a madman. Um, and 
so he is out of touch with rationality. Uh, who declares the death of God? Who continues to seek for God uh, in, in this situation? The madman, someone alienated from rationality, right? Rationality, which has become, through uh, metaphysics, the ultimate link to God and the sight of godliness and the divine within the human being. So the madman is um, already alienated from uh, this idea, this establishment idea of what God is. And it's that establishment idea of God that makes God uh, unimportant and a, a thing for children. Um, so the lighting of the lantern in the morning is a sign of his madness. But uh, when we recall the fact that truth is always associated in Western metaphysics with light, uh, this image also points to the fact that for the madman who uh, no longer believes in the, uh, the accepted, established God, but seeks a uh, truer, more real God, uh, that the light of God, like the light of day, no longer illuminates the world, no longer makes sense. So the madman is, uh, is blind, uh, cannot see by the light of the established idea of God, and must light his own lantern to see by. Uh, day and night have been reversed, uh, perhaps, and the madman is out of step with not just the establishment, but with time, with temporality. Uh, the other way to interpret this would be that the madman declaring the death of God and seeking this, uh, this other God, or seeking God in some new way, uh, has come too early, is a prophet that has arrived uh, too early for his message to be heard. Right? Um, for the madman who needs a lantern in the morning uh, is someone who is operating as if it is already night uh, when daylight is already burning. So, next paragraph. The madman jumped into their midst and pierced them with his eyes. Whither is God? He cried. I will tell you. We have killed him, you and I. All of us are his murderers. But how did we do this? How could we drink up the sea? Who gave us the sponge to wipe away the entire horizon? What were we doing when we unchained the earth from its sun? Whither is it moving now? Uh, whither uh, are we moving? Away from all suns. Are we not plunging continually, backward, sideward, forward, in all directions? So, the first thing to say about this is uh, that God is dead, uh, and I think we need to distinguish very um, carefully between the idea that God does not exist and the idea that God is dead. Uh, and by saying that God is dead rather than that God doesn't exist, Nietzsche is already placing God uh, within this world, within this realm, um, as something that belongs to the temporal order and is affected by time and has a kind of lifespan. Gods are born and they die. Uh, so he's not making a kind of metaphysical argument about the superstructure of reality saying there is no God. Uh, he's not making an empirical argument saying there's no evidence of God and therefore there is no God. He's saying there was a God, uh, but God is dead. Uh, he's saying um, not just that God is dead, but that we have killed him. And this goes back to um, the idea of <clears throat> uh, nihilism being at the center of Platonic metaphysics and Christian theology. Right? Um, by sort of um, over-determining God, by making God part of this system, uh, by making God something rational, 
uh, and by sort of assuming that we have a handle on what God is within the system of nature and being, um, we have killed God. We are his murderers. The question is, how did we do this? Nietzsche gives us a series of images. How could we drink up the sea, wipe away the entire horizon? How could we have unchained this earth from its sun? Right? So all of these images have to do with uh, what happens in the wake of the death of God. After the death of God, after uh, the destruction of the idea of absolute truth, um, we are left without any orientation, without any direction, without any sense of what is good or true, and therefore without any idea of what we ought to do. Uh, right? We've unchained this earth from its sun, means, um, again, right? God is light, God is like the sun, the cause of all things, uh, and now that we have uh, come to doubt uh, God, or now that God has died, um, we are, uh, like the earth, unchained from the source of truth. We no longer have a, a bearing. We no longer have an orientation. Uh, we no longer have a horizon, which is to say uh, something in the future that we move toward. We no longer have a set goal. We are now continually plunging backward, sideward in all directions. We don't know up or down. Uh, we are lost. And this is the experience of, of nihilism, right? To realize and embrace that nihilism at the heart of metaphysics and to attempt to um, get one's bearings in that nihilism is Nietzsche's task, right? If once we become unchained from this objective truth, uh, from any objective truth, uh, how can we ever decide what is right or good or true? How do we uh, decide how to act or what to do? How do we move through this nihilism and find new bearings? Uh, right? He says, again, do we not need to light lanterns in the morning? Do we hear nothing as yet of the noise of the gravediggers who are burying God? Right? We need uh, new light. And again, um, to point out, again, the sort of individualist strain in Nietzsche. Uh, where is the source of truth going to come from? Uh, it's no longer going to be one fixed truth that is good for all like the sun, uh, but it's going to be found in individual lanterns, in individual lights. Uh, we must be responsible for lighting our own path. Right? So here is the uh, most famous phrase. Right? God is dead, God remains dead, and we have killed him. How shall we comfort ourselves, the murderers of all murderers? What was holiest and mightiest of all that the world has yet owned has bled to death under our knives. Uh, right? So, again, what do we do with this? Moving on to the next page, 182. It says, Here the madman fell silent and looked again at his listeners, and they too were silent and stared at him in astonishment. At least he threw his lantern on, at last he threw his lantern on the ground, and it broke into pieces and went out. I have come too early, he said then. My time is not yet. Right? Uh, people are too uh, attached to these ideas of God and of truth. They aren't ready to hear the madman's message. Uh, this tremendous event is still on its way, still wandering. It has not yet reached the ears of men. Uh, and so I would refer you also to Another aphorism, um, a little bit, I believe, above here, right? Uh, New Struggles, which is aphorism 108, where he writes, After Buddha was dead, his shadow was still shown for centuries in a cave, a 
a tremendous, gruesome shadow. God is dead, but given the way of men, there may still be caves for thousands of years in which his shadow will be shown. And we, we still have to vanquish his shadow too. So people are not prepared to hear this news. They aren't ready to hear what the madman has to say. Uh, they aren't ready to release themselves from, uh, from the nihilism of metaphysics uh, and the um, sort of established ideas of the good. Despite the fact that God is dead, if God is dead, people will go on living as though he were alive for many centuries to come. And as Nietzsche says in that aphorism, New Struggles, the uh, next goal, right, uh, what we must do for the new year, as we saw in that last aphorism, is find a new way to be, find a, a new God uh, or a new system of belief. Um, whether or not Nietzsche thinks we need a new God or not is, is, is debatable. Probably not. Probably the source of truth and the good will not have to do with, uh, with God. Um, a single unified God that is absolute and universal, um, but a new relationship to the divine, a new relationship to truth. This is the coming task. So, um, he ends by saying, What after all are these churches now if they are not the tombs and sepulchres of God? Right? The uh, belief in God is now uh, it's no longer relevant. It's outdated. Uh, we need to find a new way to think about truth and the good. Um, all right, so I have to go. We have office hours now. I'm going to send you these videos now. Uh, I think I will um, pick up, we'll look at one more of these aphorisms before we jump into uh, the genealogy of morals for next class. Uh, and the aphorism I still want to go over is the greatest weight. Um, where we get uh, some idea of what Nietzsche thinks we can replace uh, traditional metaphysics with. So we'll start with that next uh, lecture, and then we'll move into a discussion of the genealogy of morals. Uh, so I apologize for breaking this lecture up into, into two, um, but uh, thanks for bearing with me. We'll try to avoid this uh, in the future. All right, until next time, signing off. Thanks. Uh, bye.